working with graphs of groups and then just like tell you about some theorems that have used best theory theory and sort of I don't know give you examples of like where it comes up and how it's useful in in these theorems um so once we reach that part of the talk if there's something that you want me to attempt to spend more time explaining please let me know um the idea will be just to like sort of give the idea and the intuition for what's going on um but there will be like a fair amount of like new information so if you get overwhelmed just try to hang on as best you can and stop me if you're if you're very confused so let's let's dive into it um so the first thing i want to talk about is a uh, a so-called normal form for paths in a graph of groups um and to do that what i want to do is um for each oriented edge remember i'm, I'm sort of cheating so each edge counts twice um, I want to choose a set of coset representatives. I'm going to call it S sub E, where E is the oriented edge E. Um, for the vertex group, um, which corresponds to the terminal vertex of E, um, the, the set of cosets of the edge group in that vertex group. I also want to make sure that the um, identity belongs to this set of coset representatives, um, just to like make sure I'm not doing any funny business. Um, so a path in a graph of groups, remember that's just a finite sequence of group elements uh, of vertex groups and edges. Um, we, we had a picture of it yesterday. So this is really sort of a connected object in, 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 in a sense. I'm not doing anything silly. Um, I'm going to say that it's in normal form if for each of my group elements, um, except for possibly the last one, the group element belongs to the set of coset representatives. Um, it turns out that every path is homotopic rel endpoints to a path in normal form. Um, and I guess also homotopically non-trivial loops have non-trivial normal form. And the, the idea is like not, this isn't so bad. Um, so if, for instance, if we have um, G not equal to let's say S not um, uh, E1 bar, something like this. Um, so, so this guy is supposed to be belong to S um, E1 bar. And um, this is an element of the, so, so this is one of my coset representatives and I'm not that coset representative, I'm off by an element of the edge group. So if we have something that looks like this, and so I go E1 and then maybe G1. Uh, oh, sorry. So, so, so in uh, G naught E1, G1. What I can do is I can replace this path by homot uh, homot a path that's homotopic rel endpoints. Um, and it'll look like uh, S naught E1. And then I'm going to push my element of my edge group to the other side, like this, and then do G1. And basically what I will do is by uh, inductively do this so that each of my uh, vertex group elements belongs to my set of coset re representatives, except for possibly the last one because there's nowhere to push that final uh, edge group element. So that's the idea of these normal forms. Um, they're useful for sort of uh, reasoning algebraically about say a fundamental group of the graph of groups. Um, I also want to tell you about the kernel of an action on a tree. Um, for the last one, can you choose an edge? I'm not, uh, oh, oh, I, I see what you're saying. So you're saying if my last group element, my GN doesn't belong to, um, one of these sets of coset representatives, could I push it forward? The answer is no, but only because there won't be a, an E sub n plus one to push it forward, like past. That's the idea. Okay, so if I have the group acting on a tree T with the quotient graph of groups being, so so I guess secretly, I mean without inversions, but since I can always arrange uh, the, for the action to be without inversions by passing to the barycentric subdivision, I'm just gonna never say that. Um, 
the coalition graph of groups is gamma and G. Um, the kernel of the action turns out to be the largest normal subgroup of G contained in, so this is supposed to be the intersection over all of the oriented edges of my graph, um, of the inclusion of the edge group in uh, the vertex groups. So for example, uh, we had our action of SL2Z on the fairy tree and the quotient graph of groups looked like this. It had um, one edge and two vertices and the vertex groups were the cyclic of order four and order six. And the edge group was cyclic of order two. Since uh, I guess this, all subgroups of abelian groups are normal. Uh, this edge group is gonna be normal in both of its associated vertex groups. So uh, this cyclic group of order two will act trivially on the fairy tree. Cool, um, onwards. Okay, so now I wanna tell you some more vocabulary and, and kind of like, I don't know, cultural things about Bastier theory. Um, so what we said yesterday was that a group splits if uh, there exists a graph of groups with fundamental group uh, isomorphic to G, such that G is not equal to any vertex group of that graph of groups. And what that means in terms of the action on the tree is that there exists an action of your group G on a tree um, without a global fixed point, because that global fixed point would belong to, um, I guess either an edge or a vertex and it would have stabilizer equal to all of G. So in the quotient graph of groups, you would see that there. Um, and we say that a group has Sayre's property FA, F stands for fix and A stands for arbor in French, I guess, um, if it does not split. So what that means is that whenever you have G acting on a tree T, there's a global fixed point for the action. Um, some examples of groups with property FA include S, L, and Z for N at least three. Uh, most triangle groups, if you know what that those are, um, I guess if you, none of the labels of your triangle have label infinity, then that triangle group has Sayre's property FA. Uh, the mapping class group for, I'll say a closed surface of genus G at least three, just to hedge my bets. Um, I don't know if it's true for G equals to two, and I know, know that it is false for the torus. Um, Sayre's property FA passes to quotients, just because if you have a quotient group of your group G and your quotient group acts on a tree, then G also acts by uh, factoring through the quotient map first and then doing the action. Um, but it doesn't in general pass the subgroups. Uh, it's a theorem of Watani from the eighties though, that if your group has Kajdan's property T, which we heard a lot about in uh, Federico's talks, then your group and all of its finite index subgroups also have Sayre's property FA. So in some sense, property T is stronger than property FA. Great. Okay, so now, uh, oh, I'm gonna tell you uh, 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 an equivalent formulation of what Sears property FA is, and then we're gonna get to lots of the, the zoo of examples of, of groups acting on trees. So the a theorem by Sayre, um, it's in trees, the book, um, is that having property FA is equivalent to the following three conditions. So if um, you are not the fundamental group of a graph of groups, you, if you don't split, then whenever you can write your group G as an amalgamated free product of A and B amalgamated along C, then either your whole group is uh, isomorphic to A and C is equal to B, or you know the, the uh, symmetric statement where G is isomorphic to B and A is equal to C. So you're not an amalgam is the idea, not an amalgam. And this, this covers, I guess the idea um, is, so if you have your graph gamma and G, um, this covers the case um, when, the case where gamma itself is um, a tree. Um, the idea being that if gamma itself were a tree, what you would wanna do is collapse edges of gamma until you have just one left. And then that would realize a different graph of groups um, 
with one edge and it would be an amalgamated free product splitting of your group. Um, the other possibility is you want uh, Z to not be a quotient of G. And this is, this is supposed to um, covers the, the other case. So where um, case, let me not, the case where uh, gamma has a loop. Um, there again, the idea is that you could collapse all of your uh, edges of your best hair tree, or sorry, of your uh, quotient graph down until you have just one edge left and that edge will form a loop. And if the original uh, graph of groups was a splitting for your group G, then so will this group, this graph of groups be. Um, it will be, I guess, an HNN extension in the language that we talked about from before. Um, oh, I guess, by the way, I want to point out, um, there always exists a homomorphism, a surjection from the fundamental group of a graph of groups to the ordinary fundamental group of your graph. Um, the idea just being forget all of the vertex groups. Um, in fact, uh, this map splits. So every group um, that's the fundamental group of a, of a graph of groups is uh, a possibly trivial semi-direct product with uh, a free group, which is kind of cool. Uh, and then the final condition is that um, if you can write your group as a, a, a union of um, subgroups, which like an ascending union, then um, it's kind of like a, a no Ethereum condition. The, then, then the ascending union is actually a finite union. Um, so your whole group is equal to one of the uh, element, like the terms in this, in this sequence. Um, this condition, if, if your group is countable, is equivalent to your group being finitely generated. Um, the idea being, if you have such an ascending sequence of subgroups, then each, then if you pick a finite generating set, eventually all of your generators will belong to some finite term of that thing. And so then you are able to conclude that that subgroup is actually the whole group. Um, and and this, this last uh, statement is really necessary. Um, Q splits, uh, even though Q as a group is not an amalgamated free product. It does not have a surjection onto the integers, but because it is the ascending union of a sequence of subgroups, you can form um, kind of a, a, a weird tree, I guess. Um, what's the idea? I guess maybe um, the quotient graph of groups will sort of look like uh, the, uh, maybe Z adjoin one half, um, Z adjoin one half and one third, blah, 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 blah. So it'll be an infinite, the quotient graph of groups will be infinite. Um, oh, and then I guess the, the edge groups will be like, uh, this map will always be an isomorphism of edge groups and this map will be the obvious inclusion. So. Isomorphism, isomorphism. So it, in the, if you look in the Bastard tree, the action of Q on this tree, um, it will sort of preserve this infinite line that kind of marches off to infinity, um, which was kind of like the picture that we saw for the bomb sog solitaire groups uh, yesterday. But um, there the quotient uh, turned out to be just a circle because there was also an element that translated in this, in the direction of that line. In the case of Q, there is no such line. So that's the idea. Uh, there's a question, uh, do braid groups have property FA? Braid group, I believe, um, I believe that braid groups themselves probably have property FA, but pure braid groups do not. So um, the pure braid group, uh, I guess it admits a uh, surjection onto the pure break group on n minus one strands. And you, if you forget all the way down to uh, the pure break group on two strands, that's just uh, Z. So the pure break groups do not have property FA. 
I think that the break groups themselves may, but I don't know off the top of my head. Um, having property FA, I guess um, this discussion is showing, doesn't pass to finite index over groups um, either. Great. Wait, sorry. That's not what I said. Having a splitting, uh, a, a finite index subgroup splitting does not imply that the, the whole group splits. That's, that's what I should say. Great, great. So we've learned about property FA, we've learned about normal forms. Um, are we ready to, to, to see a crazy amount of applications? Sounds good, okay, cool. So what is my first one? Oh, my first one is very classical. So I wanna talk about ends of groups. Um, this theorem will be due to Freudenthal and Hopf from the 40s. Um, so if you have a, a topological space, you can form its uh, space of ends um, by just a very general construction. It's um, the inverse limit of the connected components of um, X take away a compact set as the compact sets vary over all of the compact subsets of your space. Um, Is that, is, that, is that fine as, as an idea? The idea really is that um, what you wanna know is whether you can disconnect your uh, space by removing a compact set. Um, if you can at all, then you have at more than one end. If you're compact, you have zero ends. If um, as you move larger and larger compact sets, maybe the number of ends increases, you might think that the number of ends would go to infinity. That's the, that's the idea. Um, if your group is finally generated, say by S, then you could set the, num the ends of your group to be the ends of one of its Cayley graphs. Uh, and it's the theorem of Freud and Fall, Fall and Hupf that if you have a finitely generated group, then its space of ends has cardinality zero, one, two, or infinity. They also showed, I guess this is sort of obvious, that um, a Cayley graph is compact if and only if the group is finite, right? So if you have zero ends, then your group is finite. They also showed that if your group has two ends, then um, your group is virtually infinite cyclic. In fact, uh, Wall showed later that you are virtually Z if and only if there's a finite normal subgroup uh, who's such that the quotient group is either infinite cyclic or the infinite dihedral group. Um, there's actually, I, I believe there's a, a, a generalization. This generalizes to um, Euclidean groups. I.e. if you have a group that acts properly discontinuously and co-compactly on the Euclidean plane uh, or, or a Euclidean end space, then there's a finite normal subgroup such that the quotient is um, a wallpaper group or, or a higher dimensional analog of a wallpaper group. Um, and the argument, I guess, for, for, for this case is, is sort of the, the same idea as the argument for that case as well. Great. Um, so that takes care of uh, the case of zero ends and the case of two ends. Um, what about one end and infinitely many ends? So first of all, for examples, um, Z2 has uh, one end. And we can think about this together. If you think about the plane, like the Euclidean plane, and you remove a compact subset, the, that uh, the complement will have um, at most one non-compact uh, I guess one component with non-compact closure. Um, you could do something silly like, so here's my plane. It looks like this. I could remove like maybe a donut. Like I'm removing everything that's purple. That's a fine compact set. And now the complement will have two components, but this one will die eventually. This one has a uh, compact closure. So this component doesn't count at infinity in, in some wishy-washy way. Um, but this, this component of the complement, the big one does count. 
And there will always be this big, big component and no small components in the limit. So this, uh, the Euclidean plane has uh, one end. Actually, the same argument shows the hyperbolic plane has one end as well. And so do um, Euclidean and hyperbolic end space for larger n. So uh, in, in some sense, having one end is, is going to be the generic case. Um, but we would still like to understand what happens for groups with infinitely many ends. Um, John Sollings also wanted to understand what happens. And so let's tell, let, let me tell you what he showed. If you have a, so he shows this in the 70s. If you have a finitely generated group with infinitely many ends, then G splits as the fundamental group of a graph of groups where your edge groups are all finite. So um, if, let me just remark, if uh, G is torsion free, then this means that um, G is a free product. Um, and in general, that like the, yeah. And the idea is, is, is basically generalizing that to the case where you have finite edge, group, edge groups as well. So the idea of the proof is um, to show that you have infinitely many ends. What you want is, um, I guess, an almost invariant uh, subset, which we'll take to be a subset of our group. Um, in this, and it's almost invariant in the sense that the symmetric difference of its translate by any group element with itself is finite. So let me draw the, the picture. So the idea of the symmetric difference is that you take your two sets and you look at the things that are in uh, one, but not both. So this is the symmetric difference. Um, I guess if this is x and this is y, uh, then x triangle y, I think it's triangle, I don't know if that's standard, is um, the union minus the intersection. You can take that to be a definition. Um, so, so the idea really is that uh, any group element will take the set off of itself, but only a finite amount off of itself. And, um, and A and G take away A are infinite. So if you can find such an invariant subset, then you can build a tree, um, I guess where your vertices are uh, the translates of A and its complement. Uh, so here's my, here's my group. And I have my almost invariant subset A. And um, so here's A. Here's uh, A, I guess, the complement of A. And I'm going to connect them by an edge. And then I'll just sort of do this equivariantly. Um, I'll do the same thing for, for I guess, G, uh, the image of A under G, and um, also the image of the complement under G. And um, uh, what is the idea? Oh, the things that um, will stabilize this edge, this edge stabilizer will be finite, finite, um, basically because of this condition. Is that right, what I want? I mean, I claim that that's what I want, but I'm allowing myself to be wrong. But but morally, the idea is that you have you you could think about taking your Cayley graph for your group, and the idea is that um, the these stabilizers or these things that belong to um, this uh, this symmetric difference, um, if you remove them, you'll disconnect your group, and then because groups are homogeneous objects, um, you'll be able to sort of do this uh, everywhere. And um, I guess what you've shown is that you have more than one end. Um, and then you just need to argue that if you have exactly two ends, uh, then this process 
only gives you two infinite components uh, in the limit. So that, that, that's roughly the idea. Um, an immediate question you might ask is, okay, so I have a, a structure theorem for groups with infinitely many ends. Um, can I sort of uh, break my group into one-ended pieces using this theorem? And first, I want to tell you about the, the case where you can. There's a ahead. question, but, but I think maybe you should read it. <laughs> uh, uh, let me make the chat visible to myself. Right. Where's the chat? Uh, how are we connecting A to anything but G minus A? Do we connect it to G A or something? Yeah, I think that's the idea. Um, yeah, let me see. What 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 should be the idea? Well, I guess what, what what should be a uh, let me let me draw a picture, um, and then we'll see what we think um, about this picture. So copy, paste, great, clear this page, great. Uh, don't bookmark it. Great. Okay, great. Okay, so here is my group. Um, what I have is. Uh, a way of cutting my group into two infinite pieces. So I have um, my piece A and my piece, uh, I'm gonna call it A star, because apparently that's normal for D without A. And um, the tr uh, I guess you could think about this as like a, a wall, if that's a, a word that you, you know. Um, and then you could sort of translate this picture everywhere. So there are like, um, walls in your group, um, wall just in the sense that it disconnects the group. And um, the pieces, I guess the complements are, are, are always infinite. Um, so, so really what you do is you, you build this picture first. Um, and you can build this picture just from the, the statement that um, uh, both of these pieces are infinite and um, their, uh, their overlap is finite. Oh, I didn't actually say that their overlap is finite. I was thinking it in my head, but I did not say it. Okay, so what I want is, um, for example, if we're doing this in the Cayley graph, um, I want the the like the edge boundary of these two sets to be the common edge boundary to be um, finite, in the, in kind of in the sense that uh, Federico was talking about. So if if we're in a Cayley graph of my group. I want the set of edges um, with, uh, I guess, one vertex in A and the other vertex in uh, its complement. I want this set to be finite. That's that's going to be my definition of a wall. Um, um, and then I guess the idea being that since um, your group acts freely on its Cayley graph, there are only a finite number of group elements that could possibly send this wall to itself, right? That's the idea. So, so the, the stabilizer of this wall in your group is finite. Um, so this implies a stabilizer of wall is finite. Um, and then, and then you build a, a tree that's sort of dual to this picture. Um, there is one question that you should ask. So I'm going to sketch the tree. The tree is basically the same. You have um, a vertex for each complementary component, and then you join them by an edge if uh, they are separated by um, a translate of the wall. So the question that you should ask is. Um, why, why should it be the case that walls don't cross, right? Like, um, why, why, why doesn't this happen? And that's, I think, the, the hard part of the theorem that I don't know about. Um, so I'm going to punt. 
Um, but so, sort of morally, this is the idea. You're, you're cutting your group up into pieces and then uh, you're doing it in an equivariant way. Um, and so your group will act on the resulting tree. If, uh, if your walls do cross, by the way, um, if your walls cross, you get a cat zero Q complex instead of a tree. Um, so walls crossing is not a terrible situation, um, but it's not one that I'm gonna talk about, uh, but it is one that people care about very deeply. Great. Oh, so what I said earlier was, um, if I know that my group has infinitely many ends, I can form this picture and um, the stabilizer of this edge will be the stabilizer of this wall and so it will be finite. Is there a reason that, um, yes, I end up finding a vertex for each coset, that's right. Um, is there a reason to expect uh, that I could sort of do this a finite number of times and then the process will terminate? Um, and the answer a priori is no. Um, there are, uh, so there exist um, finitely generated groups uh, which can be split over finite groups uh, forever or like infinitely many times. So that's bad. But are there, is there a class of groups where um, that does not happen? Uh, and, and it turns out that both this example um, and the theorem that's on the next slide are due to Dunwoody. Um, Dunwoody showed that uh, groups which are, oh no. All right, I'm getting ahead of myself, but let's, let's go do it anyway. Uh, so we're gonna say that a group is accessible if there uh, is a splitting of your group with one-ended vertex groups and finite edge groups. Um, so this, this splitting is, uh, I guess it, it, it's kind of the maximal uh, way of applying Stalling's theorem all at once in one tree, right? I can't, uh, I can't break up my vertex groups across finite edge groups anymore. Um, so, so this is my accessible splitting. Um, and Dunwoody shows that finitely presented groups are accessible. So the class of all finitely generated groups are, is not um, accessible in this sense, but the finitely presented ones are. And the idea um, is kind of similar to this, this picture that we had before, where we're gonna cut up maybe a Cayley graph for our group into pieces, um, and then argue that there's a, a dual tree um, that has the properties that we want. But what we'll really do is um, we're gonna use uh, what's called a presentation complex. Uh, Sam just points out that maybe you want to say uh, a finite splitting. A finite splitting. Um, yeah, I guess if, uh, yeah, yeah, I do. Um, the, so yeah, this, so finite generation of your group implies, um, so, Finite generation of G implies the splitting um, gamma and G ha is finite in the sense that gamma is a finite graph. Um, and this is really just because uh, the number of the minimum number of generators for G um, is bounded below by the number of generators for each of the vertex groups and like some function of the number of edges as well, or really the Euler characteristic of the graph. So if that um, were infinite, then you would, your group would not be finitely generated. Um, okay, so the idea is to use a presentation complex for G, uh, since that's the only thing we're sort of um, guaranteed by the assumption that G is finitely presented. And so what that is, a, a presentation complex is a, um, so it's a compact or a finite two-dimensional CW complex with um, fundamental group isomorphic to G. And then, um, so it looks, I don't know, in the universal, the universal cover is kind of like a Cayley graph for your group, except that you've glued in a two cell for every relation 
um, in your finite presentation for your group. And what then what he does is he does basically the same thing. He defines something called a, uh, a track and a, and, and a band. Um, and, and what it really is, is it's a way of cutting up your presentation complex into pieces um, and the pieces don't cross. So these are like tracks um, or uh, bands as in Katie's got. And um, the, the, the action of your group on the universal cover of its presentation complex. Um, sorry, what was, I don't understand the question. What was I C W X? Two dimensional CW complex. This is supposed to be like dimensional. Is that, was that the question? Okay, um, again, the idea is to cut up the presentation complex into pieces equivariantly, and then say that the action on the group uh, preserves the, the sort of dual tree, um, which again, just sort of looks like this. And that the stabilizers are finite because the stabilizer of each track is finite. Again, that's sort of the, the rough idea of, of how this, this proof goes. Um, excellent. Oh, so, so I, I, I said things out of order, but, um, what one thing that this implies is if I replace finite edge groups with trivial edge groups, what I should get is a statement about, um, free product decompositions of my group. And in fact, it's true. There's a, an old theorem due to Grishko. Uh, and it says the following. So suppose your group G, which we'll say is finitely generated, is uh, a free product of uh, finite, finitely many groups A, AI, I guess, and a free group FN. Um, so FN is a free group and each AI cannot be written as a free product. Uh, so I guess we could take that to mean um, does not act on a tree with uh, trivial edge stabilizers and not infinite cyclic. Um, if you have, if any of the AIs are infinite cyclic, then you're supposed to lump them into the free group factor part. Um, the idea really being that uh, infinite cyclic groups can act, um, they, they, they can act in like a covering space fashion on trees, i.e. they can sort of translate along the tree. Whereas each of these groups will have to act elliptically. They'll have to fix some vertex of the tree. Um, and so the statement of the theorem says that if you have another such free, free product decomposition of your group, so into a priori different subgroups, B1 through BL, and a free group FM, then it turns out that the number of factors is equal in both cases. So this K is equal to this L and this N is equal to this M. And after reordering, perhaps each BI is a conjugate of uh, AI in, 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 and the I's are supposed to match up. Uh, and this is one of the reasons for um, throwing this free uh, factor part off to itself um, is that it, the statement is not true if uh, like it, it is not true that this free fact, this free group is conjugate to that free group in G. Um, yeah, that was maybe more confusing than I meant it to be. Um, but the idea is, is, is fairly simple. Um, so the idea is if, um, so, so this action gives you a, a splitting that looks like this. So that I'm gonna draw my first splitting. So it will have N loops. So there are N, N petals, I guess, of my rows. And then there'll be K extra sort of um, spiny edges. Uh, and then each of these spiny edges will have uh, a stabilizer equal to 
one of the AIs. So there will be K of those. And my edge stabilizers or my edge groups will be trivial. So this is a, a graph of groups um, with fundamental group isomorphic to G. Great. So that's the first part. And the idea is that um, G is isomorphic to itself, right? So um, G acts on, on the Basser tree uh, for, for the splitting. And um, I'm going to look at each of these subgroups. So the fact that each BI is freely indecomposable means that it stabilizes some vertex in the Basser tree for the splitting. So what that means is that each BI is a subgroup of um, some AI, but actually, uh, or really some conjugate of AI since the vertex stabilizers of, so in, in, so in the action of G on T, um, the BI stabilize vertex vertices. So they're contained in uh, conjugates of the AI, but actually they have to be um, the full, they have to be the full stabilizer. Um, the reason being that if there was some group element that was missing, um, it cannot be uh, an element of your group, essentially because it would have to be written as like a word um, in like more than one of the BIs and possibly some element of the free group. And so that will act um, loxodromically on the tree uh, and therefore it can't belong to any of the AI. That's sort of the, the hand wavy definition. So they're actually uh, isomorphic to st vertex stabilizers, which means that they are conjugate to the AI. And then um, the these this this free group pack factor. Um, the other idea is that you can uh, I guess pass to the quotient um, where you kill each of these BIs. Okay. And then that's a, a group that acts freely on a tree um, and with quotients uh, with fundamental group of the FN. So the fundamental groups are, are isomorphic. So the, the ranks of the free uh, factors are as well. So this is sort of like the, the, the precursor to Dunwoody's accessibility statement. The idea being that there's a bound on the complexity of a splitting where I restrict um, my edge groups. So the last thing with this flavor that I want to tell you about will also be um, somewhat similar. So we'll, we'll be looking at groups acting on trees where the edge stabilizers belong to a certain family of groups. Um, so we took care of finite edge groups um, and trivial edge groups. So the next, uh, I guess the, the next thing in, in, the, in the chain of sort of complications of groups, um, maybe we should think about virtually cyclic groups. Um, the, the, uh, the inspiration for this idea actually comes from the study of three manifolds. So let me tell you about that super briefly. So it's a theorem of uh, Jack O'Shalen and independently Johansson that if you have a prime uh, orientable three manifold, so prime, prime means uh, no, um, uh, or, or let me, say it positively, every embedded two sphere bounds a, uh, a three ball, okay? So there's no sort of, um, or in other words, I guess this, ma this three manifold is um, a spherical. Is the, so is it fair to say that the edge groups determine in some ways the complexity of the splitting if a group admits a splitting? Yeah, yeah, I think that's fair to say. Um, or an another way to think about it is that the edge groups sort of tell you about the like the flavor of the splitting. Um, if your edge groups belong to a certain family, then you can maybe sort of reason um, about the behavior of the fundamental group of the graph of groups in a uniform way if you have restrictions on the edge groups. Every steer bounds a ball is not enough for, for a spherical. Oh, okay, okay. That's probably true. Um, is it, oh, it, is prime and orientable, does that imply a spherical? I don't know. 
I think my claim is that it does, but I, I have no actual idea. So I will defer to. We can just restrict to it. It's spherical. Sure. <laughs> um, OK, so if your three manifold is prime and orientable, um, what we're going to what we want to do is decompose our three manifold along the next most complicated um, subsurface. So just in the same way that we can cut surfaces open along um, S1 times S2. Uh, sure. Um, I'm going to say, I'm going to continue to say prime, and uh, maybe I should say irreducible instead. So anyway, but, but the idea is that just like we can cut surfaces open along um, simple closed curves, we should be able to cut three manifolds open along some, I guess, uh, incompressible uh, two submanifold. We've already cut up along all of our S2s, so that's fine. Um, so what I want to do next is cut open along tori, uh, and they should be uh, incompressible, which means that the fundamental group sees the, the fundamental group of the torus. Um, and so, so the statement, which is kind of cool, says that there exists a finite such collection of incompressible tori, such that the complementary pieces of my three manifold are either a toroidal. Um, what this means is every uh, T2 is boundary parallel. Let me write boundary more quickly. Parallel or uh, ciphered fibered. And um, ciphered fibered morally, um, there are lots of tori. Um, that's what I'll say. Uh, and and there, there, there are lots of them, and they um, sort of intersect. Uh, each each torus sort of has some intersection with each other one in, the, in a separate fibered space. Um, but in terms of trees, what this is saying is that um, if you have a prime three manifold, there exists uh, a splitting. Um, this is really a finite splitting of the fundamental group of my three manifold, uh, where for ripes, where uh, the edge groups are uh, free abelian of rank two, um, and and it's sort of um, it's canonical up to certain moves, um, which are sort of well studied and well understood in um, three manifold theory. And um, this, I, I guess I wanna say that this, this theorem, um, its statement sort of uh, implies the possibility of, of um, classifying three manifolds. Um, if you know geometrization, um, the JSJ decomposition of a three manifold, uh, each of these pieces will have um, uh, a geometric structure. Well, I guess the ciphered pyroids pieces might need to be broken up further, but that's fine. Um, cool. So I guess um, something that Stallings thinks is that um, things that are true about uh, three manifolds have some echo in group theory. And the echo in group theory is what I want to, want to tell you about next. Um, so this is this is uh, called the JSJ decomposition of my three manifold. Okay. Um, so what I want to talk about is JSJ decompositions of groups, and this I think will um, speak a little bit to what Paige was asking about. So what I want to do, I'm going to let A be a class of groups which is closed undertaking subgroups. So for example, the class which could just consists of the trivial group is one. The class of finite groups is one, um, as is the class of virtually cyclic, uh, or I guess virtually Z groups. So an A tree is a graph of groups with fundamental group G, and all of my edge groups belong to A. Um, or you could think about it in terms of the, the Basser tree. Um, there you would say that G acts on the tree T and the edge stabilizers belong to A. I'm gonna go back and forth constantly between those two ways of saying the same thing. Um, so don't worry about it too much. Um, the definition due to Girdel and Levit uh, says that an A tree is a JSJ A tree. So it's sort of um, 
the best possible one if um, the following things are true. Edge stabilizers in T uh, have to fix points in every A tree. OK, so um, for example, if uh, A was the class of finite groups, um, what I know is that finite subgroups of groups acting on trees fix vertices. So uh, this is sort of vacuously satisfied for the class of uh, finite or trivial groups. Um, but for the class of, uh, say, virtually cyclic groups, this is not the case, um, right? There are ways for the, the infinite cyclic group to act on a tree without fixing any vertex. Um, but there might, it might be the case that your group has some infinite cyclic or virtually cyclic subgroups that are sort of forced to stabilize points in any A tree. So that's the first statement. The second statement is that if I have another A tree, so another graph of groups with edge groups belonging to A, then there exists a G equivariant map from my JSJ tree to my other tree. So you could think about this as, as sort of like um, T like uh, refines in some sense, the, uh, the splitting uh, determined by T prime. Um, T is sort of, uh, this is sort of saying that it's like as big as possible, right? If I have another, uh, another tree where I have the same class of edge stabilizers, then there's a map from my JSJ tree to this tree. So it's, it's kind of like an equivariant quotient of, of the JSA, JSJ tree. Um, so a theorem, very recent, I think this is the second most recent theorem that I have on these slides of Gear, Gerdal and Levit um, says that JSJ A trees exist for finitely presented groups for any, like what, regardless of what you take the class A to be. Um, but they may not be canonical. In general, they're sort of like a, there's a deformation space of um, JSJ A trees. Um, uh, and canonical, I, I guess, just means that um, the class of vertex stabilizers and edge stabilizers may not be preserved under automorphisms of my group G. But the, the deformation space will be preserved by automorphisms. So it's really the. I guess Girdell and Levite say that it's really the deformation space that's the canonical object and not the tree itself in full generality. But um, I guess one, one thing that really uh, inspired Girdell and Levite to uh, prove this theorem was a result of, I guess, originally Rips and Salah in the 90s and um, extended and refined by Bodich in 2009 which says that if, um, if I set my group, my class A to be the class of virtually cyclic groups, and I have a word hyperbolic group G, then there is a canonical JSJ A tree for G. Um, in other words, there's a canonical way to split G over virtually cyclic subgroups. Um, and the idea for this is, uh, I mean, I don't know, I guess it, it's really the same idea that we've talked about before. What I'm gonna do is gonna, I'm gonna take my group G and I'm gonna break it into pieces, build a sort of dual tree to those pieces and the group will act on this tree. Um, the idea in this case is to use, so um, Z subgroups of uh, my hyperbolic group C um, are uh, what, what's called quasi convex. And so what that means is that there's an injection from the, the Gromov boundary, if you know what that means, of G, oh, sorry, of Z into the Gromov boundary of G. This is just two points. And um, this is sort of an equivariant injection. So the, the, the Z subgroup of my group G um, will stabilize the corresponding two pairs of points in the Gromov boundary. Um, G splits over Z, I guess this is what Bowditch proves, um, if and only if uh, the, this cyclic subgroup um, separates, or I guess uh, what I'll say is are a cut pair in the Gromov boundary of G. So for example, um, 
here's a circle. The circle is the Gromov boundary of a surface group. Um, and if I pick any two endpoints, so maybe I'll think of them as the boundary of an infinite cyclic subgroup that preserves some line connecting them, some geodesic line in the hyperbolic two space. Um, what I know, uh, basically from what we said earlier, what I know is that uh, my group splits over this subgroup. Um, and, and that corresponds to the fact that it, when I remove that pair of points from the Gromov boundary, I disconnect it into two pieces. So um, Bodich's observation is that this generalizes to uh, different boundaries of groups and not just the circle. Um, the circle actually is, it turned out to be an exceptional case. Um, so the, the circle has like too many splittings. Um, in the sense that none of these are, um, none of these splittings will be re uh, represented in the resulting uh, JSJ tree. Um, that's, I don't know. What you could think about is that any two points in a circle, when you remove them, you disconnect it. That's kind of the, the reason that um, this group has too many splittings, which is kind of cool. Um, the definition of a cut pair for, I guess, uh, Kleinian groups have no such cut. Well, sorry, what am I saying? Um, if you have a finitely generated Kleinian group, then it, if it has a uh, boundary, the two sphere, then it has no such cut pairs. Um, so this group does not split over uh, virtually cyclic subgroups. Um, I think that's also the case if its boundary is, oh, sorry. The, other, the only other possibility is if the boundary is a Sir, Sierpinski carpet. And I think, I, I don't know, I'm not, I don't, I'm not totally sure of the topology, but I think that Sierpinski carpets also do not have cut pairs. Um, or I guess what I'm trying to say is that um, climbing groups would be sort of a basic piece in this JSJ decomposition theory, which sort of corresponds to what we uh, saw on the previous slide with JSJ decompositions of three manifolds. Um, why? Uh, hyperbolic, so, so Kleinian groups correspond to hyperbolic three manifolds. Hyperbolic three manifolds are atoroidal. Um, every, uh, I guess, uh, incompressible torus is parallel to the boundary. Um, so there's no JSJ decomposition of a hyperbolic three manifold. It turns out that there are, so uh, I can't resist getting very far afield. It turns out that there are ways to cut a sphere open, but the way that you cut a sphere open is along um, a curve, like a, a circle. Um, and this, I guess that this, um, plus a lot of work, I'll say uh, Hagland and Weiss, um, and also uh, Khan, and Markovich. Uh, so is that um, Kleinian groups act on cube complexes. So that's sort of the higher dimensional analog of this, this Bodich's JSJ decomposition theorem for surface groups. This theorem is true for fundamental groups of hyperbolic three manifolds. Yes, the the I, I guess what I was saying is if G, if G is the fundamental group of a hyperbolic three manifold, so hype, then it's, uh, it's JSJ decomposition is a point. Um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of the, 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 the trivially true statement. Um, I am out of time. And the rest of the things that I ha wanted to tell you have a different flavor. So I think that this makes a good stopping point. So thank you for attending the, the mini course and thank you to the organizers for having me speak. <laughs>